there were it, it, the mental side of, of tennis uh, from from my perspective as, as a fan if you like um the the two things that strike me in tennis compared to lots of other sports um that i think make it a, a big mental challenge is first of all it's an individual sport but but secondly so there's nowhere to hide like in football in yeah. a team sport you can just give the ball to another you know teammate and yeah. you cannot call for it if you like but there's nowhere to hide the other thing as well in tennis is is a, a, again in, in something like football you can be really nervous but you can get a bit lucky uh, and of course that can be the case in tennis but but basically you know your 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 body could be shaking when you're about to take a penalty okay and you can yeah. still score because you can just put your foot through it right you know you yeah. just hit it as hard as you can and actually, probably you will still score because of the, the odds on that. Yeah. But there's, there's that, that in a, in a sport such as darts, snooker, tennis, where you need to be pretty calm and you need to have a pretty steady hand. There's just nowhere to hide. Is there anything I'm missing, or am I, you know, am I am I underplaying something, or even overplaying? No, no. I think I think you're 100 percent correct. I think the the real tough thing about you know these sports and, and tennis in particular because of how physical it is as well, is the relentlessness of point after point. And if you're nervous, you have to fight through those nerves sometimes for, you know, an hour. <laughs> and and they might disappear for a while, but then suddenly, you know, you're you're five all and and it's tight again and you're feeling very tight and you have to manage it over and over again. And I think, you know, the best players in the world just, you know, use their tools and remember to use their tools in in big moments. Because, you know, once you get to pro level, it's not like any player doesn't kind of know what they have to do. But it's in the heat of that moment that they either don't remember because the brain is frying a little bit or they don't have the courage to use them. Yeah. So, you know, for us sitting there, you know, I remember when Roger Federer had two match points against Novak at Wimbledon serving. Yeah. You know, you're thinking, serve and volley both. Okay. Yeah, probably Novak's not going to make a great return on both. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know what, what, you know, whether that, what Roger was thinking or maybe knew something more than that. I did, but that was my thinking, uh, but he didn't. And, and you know, they, they slipped through his hands. Now, you know, to do that, though, in that moment takes a huge amount of courage. Yeah. And, and, and you know, first to make the decision and then secondly to, to follow through the decision like that. Um, you know, but then you've always got, and this is what's so tough for players, the other thing is, you know, match point, make the person play don't you know don't serve and give them a quick volley or whatever and uh that's you know that's that's another school of thought but i think deep down players get to a place where they have an instinct and i think you know i say this over and over again the best players in the world are are the most relaxed and the bravest because in those moments when their instinct is telling them something they are brave enough to to follow it, and which is why. Uh, and again, it doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but I do think it starts to push the odds more in your favor. I I'll oh. just say one other thing is yeah. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever been go karting or any kind of motor racing or watches motor racing, mm -hmm. but when a when a driver gets in the groove, they lap like within 0.1 of a second mm -hmm, mm -hmm. every lap, like in this unbelievable groove. Mm -hmm. But if they lose that groove, when they're in that groove, it seems so easy. Just, mm -hmm. just do it, right? Mm -hmm. No hassle. But if they lose that groove, if they go a little too fast, then, you know, they, they slide out of a corner, they lose time. If they go a little too slow, then that's no, not effective. And the margins are so small to stay on that, group and for players as well when you go into something like the, the the french open or any you know any tournament but you know especially the big ones you hope that you can get through that first match and find a groove and if you get in that groove uh then that gives you your best chances of winning because 
then most stuff is happening automatically, which is the most effective. Uh, so, you know, everybody has a problem when they start to think on the court and, and automatic is, is fastest and easiest because you know how to do things. And it's not like you, you, you don't register. I say when you're playing very well, you are aware of everything, but nothing distracts you. When, when you start to think, your thoughts start to distract you. And that's very difficult to manage. And if you can learn how to manage that and get yourself back in the groove a little faster than, than other players, uh, that's, that's obviously, you know, helps with, with ranking and, and why certain players, you know, are more consistent than others because they tend to manage that better. I hope that makes sense anyway. It does. You know, it definitely does. There were, it, it, the mental side of, of tennis, uh, from, from my perspective as, as a fan, if you like, um, the, the two things that strike me in tennis compared to lots of other sports um, that I think make it a, a big mental challenge is, first of all, it's an individual sport. But, but secondly, so there's nowhere to hide. Like in football, in yeah. a team sport, you can just give the ball to another you know, teammate and yeah. you cannot call for it, if you like. But there's nowhere to hide. The other thing as well in tennis is, is a, a, again, in, in something like football, you can be really nervous, but you can get a bit lucky. Uh, and of course, that can be the case in tennis. But, but basically, you know, your, your, your body could be shaking when you're about to take a penalty, okay? And you can yeah. still score because you can just put your foot through it, right? You know, you yeah. just hit it as hard as you can. And actually, probably you will still score because of the, the odds on that. Yeah. But there's, there's that, that in, a, in a sport such as darts, snooker, tennis, where you need to be pretty calm and you need to have a pretty steady hand, there's just nowhere to hide. Is there anything I'm missing, or am I, you know, am I am I underplaying something, or even overplaying? No, no. I think I think you're 100 percent correct. I think the the real tough thing about you know these sports and, and tennis in particular because of how physical it is as well, is the relentlessness of point after point. And if you're nervous, you have to fight through those nerves sometimes for, you know, an hour. <laughs> and, and they might disappear for a while, but then suddenly, you know, you're, you're five all and, and it's tight again and you're feeling very tight and you have to manage it over and over again. And I think, you know, the best players in the world just, you know, use their tools and remember to use their tools in in big moments. Because, you know, once you get to pro level, it's not like any player doesn't kind of know what they have to do. But it's in the heat of that moment that they either don't remember because the brain is frying a little bit or they don't have the courage to use them. Yeah. So, you know, for us sitting there, you know, I remember when Roger Federer had two match points against Novak at Wimbledon serving. Yeah. You know, you're thinking, serve and volley both. Okay. Yeah, probably Novak's not going to make a great return on both. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know what, 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 you know, whether that, what Roger was thinking or maybe knew something more than that. I did, but that was my thinking, uh, but he didn't. And, and you know, they, they slipped through his hands. Now, you know, to do that, though, in that moment takes a huge amount of courage. Yeah. And, and, and you know, first to make the decision and then secondly to, to follow through the decision like that. Um, you know, but then you've always got, and this is what's so tough for players, the other thing is, you know, match point, make the person play don't you know don't serve and give them a quick volley or whatever and uh that's you know that's that's another school of thought but i think deep down players get to a place where they have an instinct and i think you know i say this over and over again the best players in the world are are the most relaxed and the bravest because in those moments when their instinct is telling them something they are brave enough to to follow it, and which is why. Uh, and again, it doesn't guarantee you're going to win, but I do think it starts to push the odds 
more in your favor. I, I'll cool. just say one other thing is, yeah. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever been go-karting or any kind of motor racing or watches motor racing. Mm-hmm. But when a, when a driver gets in the groove, they lap like within 0.1 of a second mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of every lap, like in this unbelievable groove. Mm-hmm. But if they lose that groove, when they're in that groove, it seems so easy. Just, mm-hmm. just do it, right? Uh, mm-hmm. No hassle. But if they lose that groove, if they go a little too fast, then, you know, they, they slide out of a corner, they lose time. If they go a little too slow, then that's no, not effective. And the margins are so small to stay on that groove. And for players as well, when you go into something like the, the, the French Open or any, you know, any tournament, but, you know, especially the big ones, you hope that you can get through that first match and find a groove. And if you get in that groove, uh, then that gives you your best chances of winning because then most stuff is happening automatically, which is the most effective. Uh, so, you know, everybody has a problem when they start to think on the court and, and automatic is, is fastest and easiest because you know how to do things. And it's not like you, you, you don't register. Things. I say when you're playing very well, you are aware of everything but nothing distracts you. When, when you start to think, your thoughts start to distract you. And that's very difficult to manage. And if you can learn how to manage that and get yourself back in the groove a little faster than, than other players, uh, that's, that's obviously, you know, helps with, with ranking and, and why certain players you know, are more consistent than others because they tend to manage that better. I hope that makes sense anyway. It does. Yeah, it definitely does. There were, it, it, the mental side of, of tennis, uh, from, from my perspective as, as a fan, if you like, um, the, the two things that strike me in tennis compared to lots of other sports um, that I think make it a, a big mental challenge is, first of all, it's an individual sport. But, but secondly, so there's nowhere to hide. Like in football, in yeah. a team sport, you can just give the ball to another you know, teammate and yeah. you cannot call for it, if you like. But there's nowhere to hide. The other thing as well in tennis is, is a, a, again, in, in something like football, you can be really nervous, but you can get a bit lucky. Uh, and of course, that can be the case in tennis. But, but basically, you know, your, your, your body could be shaking when you're about to take a penalty, okay? And you can yeah. still score because you can just put your foot through it, right? You know, you yeah. just hit it as hard as you can. And actually, probably you will still score because of the, the odds on that. Yeah. But there's, there's that, that in, a, in a sport such as darts, snooker, tennis, where you need to be pretty calm and you need to have a pretty steady hand, there's just nowhere to hide. Is there anything I'm missing, or am I, you know, am I, am I underplaying something, or even overplaying? No, no. I think I think you're 100 percent correct. I think the the real tough thing about you know these sports and, and tennis in particular because of how physical it is as well, is the relentlessness of point after point. And if you're nervous, you have to fight through those nerves sometimes for Hello guys, looks like we are right on time. Uh, Matteo Arnaldi is about to serve. He won the toss, elected to begin with the, begin the match on his delivery. Uh, Matteo Arnaldi against Arthur Fins, it's actually a very exciting rivalry already. I mean, they've only played twice, obviously over the years, and Fins is also the younger player, but like he's been perceived as the way bigger prospect. But right now, I mean, Arnaldi is really making a case for himself. Uh, Fins also like not really like setting the world on fire the last few months, although he was very fine in India Wells 
just didn't really threaten Kasper Ruud. And they placed twice in 2023, uh, both matches going Arnaldi's favor. One of them wins Madrid, the ATP 1000, where after uh, a few other wins, he also managed to defeat Kasper Ruud, the aforementioned. And uh, when it comes to the US Open as well, it was a fifth, it was a five setter and it was one of the best matches of the tournament for sure. So expectations are pretty high, I think. Both players certainly uh, developing and yeah, I mean, could be on the verge of a big breakthrough result. Not that they haven't had one already, like in, in the case of Fils, of course, he's an ATP Tour champion, you know, he won two top 10 matches. Uh, Arnaldi maybe is a bit of a different case where like, yeah, he's definitely looking for that breakthrough result. But yeah, both still up and coming, uh, both exciting, both fresh to the tour, kind of learning the ropes, but having so much potential already. It should be quite exciting, that's for sure. Only a few matches left, essentially, in, in, in Miami today. Sorry if I, at any point of this broadcast, say Indian Wells. I've been doing this all week. Basically, yeah, I, I still cannot sort of, yeah, push my mind into thinking that this is already a different event. Well, that's that's the thing with this March double, the Sunshine double, March Madness, if you may. Although that's, I'm pretty sure that's simply basketball. We can't really call it that. But, uh, well, anyway, um, we have Miami here, of course. The first round of the men's draw, women's singles main draw started yesterday. The men's today. If you have any matches from earlier today you want to talk about, of course, fire away in the chat. I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll make sure to get there from time to time. And. Um, yeah, just a few left, which probably I'm also going to talk about on the changeover. Arnaldi kicking off the match with a hold to 15. Needless to say, over the past year or so, this is one of the main aspects of his game that he's improved. But even in like late 2022, especially when he jumped from clay courts to hard courts and he made this uh, final in Saint Tropez, losing to Bellucci. Uh, I think that was already when we kind of realized that, wow, I mean, Arnaldi has a serve. Arnaldi has a proper first serve. And um, yeah, this is obviously also one of the things that really allowed him to step uh, maybe like, you know, just in front of the other uh, young, talented players from the Italian generation that they have obviously such a massive, massive uh, group. However, when it comes to like future champions, future you know top twenty players, Arnaldi kind of has exceeded a few, surpassed a few that in the um, you know back in the day they were thought of as the bigger prospects for sure. And that first serve is actually part of the uh, reason for that, I think. Let's see how Arthur Fields kicks off his match, getting to the net here, but that was a little unprepared, and he pays the price. Love 15. Of course, Fils, as I said, he did very well in Indian Wells, uh, which was definitely a court profile that was suiting him a lot. Um, just the way that these courts take on spin and the details about the forehand and serve of Arthur Fields, I think it, it did work very well with him. I'm not saying that he's going to be horrific in Miami or something like that. That's not really my point. But, you know, it's, it's not as good a court for him. If they were playing in the Indian Wells, I would probably like Fils's chances more. As we are here, I mean, it's kind of 50-50 in my book. Arnaldi seems to have started a lot better, and he finds this beautiful backhand down the line here. Fantastic change of direction, really, with the previous shot just sort of adding, you know, with every single stroke in this rally, he was just adding pace, adding pace, before he eventually found that option to close out the point completely with a back and down the line winner. So low 30 uh, feels already. Forces Arnardi to slice, but will miss the next forehand. So it's just going to be three break points for Matteo now. And of course, the Italian would love that early lead. They played twice last year, as I said. Both matches were very close, though, so he knows he knows extremely well how dangerous fields can be. 
but the Frenchman so far coming up with the breakpoint saves. I mean, just one, but just a very clean serve plus one forehand. Let's see if Arnaldi can put his return deeper this time. Not really. Uh, it doesn't even go over the net. So just one more breakpoint there to be saved yet with, uh, you know, by Arthur Fields. Some early sloppiness and the uh, wonderful Arnaldi backhand down the line put him in this position, but so far he's just climbing out of it with big serves. Can he also find the first delivery on the third break point? I don't think he can. So at least that you know that's gonna be different now. It's an opportunity for Ronaldo to get a better return in and try to create something in this point. Great second serve from Fizbo. Wow. I was both aggressive but also pretty safe with the spin used. Out wide he serves this very snappy kicker. Uh and yeah, I'm not surprised that Arnaldi missed because this was this was a really ballsy second serve. Tries to go cross, it clips the net and then falls out. But the element of surprise, I think, was was definitely there. So Fisk has just saved three breakpoints, and that's pretty much all of excellent serving. You know, not 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 much else. Of course, there was also one ball that he needed to put away, but like. Yeah, his situational advantage in that rally was way too big. And it's an ace on the next point as well. So we've got Arthur Fees kind of self-botting at the moment. That's definitely like an untapped part of his game, you know, with his athletic potential, with his uh, physicality. Yeah, he could be getting more out of his serve probably will be in a few years. But even right now, he's able to win four points basically just with that shot. Let's see if he can close out the game as well. Once again, a second serve will he go for the same one? This hooked um, second serve out wide. Not really. This time just goes down the middle. Arnaldi puts a quality return in and gets an error as a reward. So I guess this is a bit of a display of how that previous breakpoint, you know, that third breakpoint could have been if he doesn't go for it. If he like really doesn't, that you know, doesn't really go for it on the second serve, I suppose. Sebastian Grosjean on our screen, looking uh, a little different than when we last saw him with a racket on the court, but well. It's been a few years. Now Fils is actually gonna have to win a rally again, and when, well, once again, he's not gonna do, the, do it. Uh, this is just some lousy forehand errors, honestly, for his standards. Finds the first one cross, but the second is like not even close to the top of the net. So one more breakpoint for Arnaldi, and yeah, so far Fitz is just serve botting to win his points. Not much else that he's been able to pull off. And once again, I mean, this time at the body, uh, speedy first serve, and because of that, um, you know, lack of time, lack of space that Arnaldi had to uh, produce the return, it's an easy point for Fies. So six minutes already in this game as well, and the Frenchman is holding strong so far, mostly on the back of that excellent serve and all the breakpoint saves he's been coming up with. Someone in the crowd is talking on his phone, and they are... Well, Arnaldi is laughing. Fils is kind of angry. Funnily enough, the guy didn't even stop talking on his phone. I guess he just started doing it quiet, more quietly. But anyway, we're playing. 
Backhands cross are traded here. Yeah, will Fins be ever be able to really like break out of a rally like this? It's, it's also a question that maybe we'll see answered as the match goes on. But so far, it's a very entertaining point. Fins tries to lob, but it's not good enough. Um, I mean, eventually he kind of did break out of that cross rally, but you could see that there was a, an opportunity for a down the line shot there. Uh, he didn't take it. You know, he doesn't have that ease that Arnaldi does. And eventually he kind of got out of play. I mean, once again, a break point for Matteo Arnaldi. There's no denying here who's started better. There's no denying who so far has been the more active and more efficient player of the crowd at the same time. But Arthur Fisk has been serving amazing so far on these break points. Will we see a different outcome now? Because once again, it's the second serve break point down. Second time I think this happened in this game. And Arnaldi is in the point and it's just going to be Fils dumping his backhand into the middle of the net. Yeah, I mean, off the ground he's been so erratic so far and it's it's just a pretty rough start for the 19-year-old. Uh, Something in the chat. My girl is killing it right now. Who the hell is my girl? Oh, Volinets, right? Yeah, I, I, I guess that's the joke. Okay. I forgot about that. Double sunshine. Hello, hello. John is going to join in 15 minutes, so I have to get everything out of my system before he comes and uh, steals the show a little bit. <laughs> At least Nurla, that's something that Nurla would say. With his equations, you know, John better than Damien and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, 30 love, Matteo Arnaldi. So really cruising towards that free love lead right now. Fizz will need to get something going off the ground so far. Uh, I mean, to, to really have a shot at this in this match because, yeah, that previous game just, just wasn't it. Sure, he was serving great down break points, but otherwise... And even now, I mean, he's just so sloppy. It's, like, absolutely fair for the Indian Wells courts, for example, to be suiting his timing more, but I mean, you just can't play like this. I mean, yeah. If he, if he keeps playing like this, he's going to end the set with like a 20 un unforced errors count or something like that. Of course, that really like the impactfulness of that depends, <laughs> the impact of that like depends on how long the set will be. But, you know, so far he's a bit of an error machine off the ground for sure. And that's an ace for Arnaldi as well to go free, love up. And as I said, uh, because we have the changeover, I will just tell you what else will be left in Miami today after this match. Just two men's, two, two matches on the men's side. Marcos Giron, Dominic Kepfer, and Alex Mikkelsen, Lucas Klein. Both very interesting, I think. Uh, maybe not like... Like, they don't really scream out night session to you, uh, if you know what I mean. But that's mostly because we have this system at the ATP Thousands, right, where the seeds don't play in the opening round. And, of course, they are matches with Americans. Uh, but but I actually think, you know, they're great sort of like hipster peaks, if you may. Uh, Mikkelsen Klein in particular, I would love to watch that. I don't think I will because, uh, well, assuming that Fils and Arnaldi don't play for too long, uh, I just don't think I will have the energy to stay up for Mikkelsen Klein. But we, we, I mean, we will see. Uh, other than Fils and Arnaldi, we don't have anything else going on the men's side right now. Whereas on the women's, three matches still in play. Uh, Nurla already mentioned Katie Volinets, who just took a first took, took the first set against Sofia Kenin. There's also Martina Trevisan against Storm Hunter. Unsurprisingly, the Australian qualifier is leading so far. The former, I guess, now doubles number one, or is she still the doubles number one? Anyway, somewhere around that. And also uh, Naomi Osaka is leading Elisabetta Cocciaretto, which I guess also wouldn't come as a surprise, but you know, Cocciaretto won the WTA 125 in Charleston last week. So she is like one of the most um, informed players on the planet, I suppose. So, you know, it's, it's something to look at. And um, that's gonna be the last match 
for the, these are the last matches for the women's singles today. And yeah, of course, I am an idiot. Uh, Sue ACA is the new uh, doubles number one on the women's side. I totally forgot about that, but it was actually a pretty big story, of course, with her getting there at this stage of her career and um, yeah, just absolutely destroying the game right now. Atrophy is love free down, already lost the first point. So, uh, you know, just one more slip up here and the set will be running away from him extremely quickly. Fies was, of course, recently bageled in that um, Fonseca match at Rio. It didn't, it felt different because that was just like Fonseca crushing every shot and, you know, just getting everything right. Here we are at low 3, low 30, and while Arnaldi is definitely playing a fine match so far, it just feels, I mean, just, yeah, cannot keep the ball in play for two, three shots of the ground. So this should be a point for him, though. Yeah, absolutely. Just gets a bit of a situational advantage here and crushes the forehand winner cross. Easy shot, but, you know, at this point, he kind of needs anything, right? He kind of needs anything to, like, get him going, so... It's still important for him to land this. And didn't feel feel like a guarantee because of what we've been seeing so far. The block return from Arnardi, Fizz goes for so much spin on the plus one forehand. And he actually misses it. That's pretty insane. I don't know, maybe he actually mishit it, you know, maybe he wasn't trying to go with such such loop on that short ball, but yeah, I mean, that, that error kind of tells you everything you need to know about this Fizz performance so far. Another block return. Ooh, wow, okay. That's a play from Arthur Fizz that you don't see every day. Um, very well hidden drop shot. Makes perfect sense too, because from that position, Arthur usually is not going to generate a lot on the backhand, so... Cool. But is he going to save the second break point as well? So far, he's good. So far, he's going to save them. Uh, just gets a forced error out of Arnaldi here, but nothing special, really. Six out of seven break points saved so far. But if he keeps facing them every game, of course, that might not end well for him, even with such a rate. And once again, just another horrific error of the ground. Arnaldi kind of throws the ball into the middle of the court. I would say usually against Fields, if you play like this, like this return, you're kind of asking for trouble. But yeah, I mean, there's no clarity. There's no sense of safety margin in Fils's game right now. He just doesn't have any control over the ball, it seems. And needs to regain it very, very quickly. Kind of lucky that this was a let because the, the return from Arnaldi was, yeah, just right in the corner. Of course, maybe that was made easier by the fact that the ball clipped the net, who knows. And yet another breakpoint save for, save for Arthur Fies as he goes out wide here on the outside and manages to get Arnaldi to miss. Holding on, holding on, mostly by the virtue of his serve, but we'll see. Maybe just one game on the board, maybe that will allow him to loosen up a little bit. Still has to work for it though. 40-40 gets another put away, but this time even sort of with the state that he started the match at, uh, you know, he's not going to miss it, even even from that position, even uh, with how shaky he's been. So it's a game point for Arthur Fields to finally be on the board and potentially produce a comeback. If he can 
threaten the Arnaldi self anytime soon. Lists his return Arnaldi, and it's actually a pretty smart one, I think. Of course, there was a possibility of his making this inside in forehand. Like, sure, he could have landed it on the line, but he did throw off Arthur's rhythm a little bit. Not that Fizz has had for, you know, rhythm in particular so far, but <laughs> I suppose it still works. And uh, once again, we are deuce, so another mammoth service game, basically, for Fizz. Another one that feels extremely crucial for him, too. Similar strategy here from Arnaldi, adding so much spin on the forehand return, but this time he overcooks it, so kind of cheap error that was granted to Fizz here, and he has another game plan. That's much better for Mardanaldi though, as he runs around his backhand, smashes the forehand cross return, eventually uh, manages to follow it up also with a forehand approach shot. Feels not in the right position, not in the right hitting zone here. Misses it to the net. So this game just won't end once again. Short combination here, just getting a couple of maybe safer, maybe a bit more quality um, on the ball, you know, better shot production, better spin, and he gets a couple of shots into the court, feels manages to get an, another error out of Arnaldi. So, can he finally get a game? Yes, he can. First serve kick serves its purpose. Arnaldi misses the return, and he is just 3 1 up now, the Italian. So, the break is, of course, still there, but Fils is on the board and has sort of, yeah, just put on some pressure, at least on Arnaldi, especially after losing this game, despite a few chances. Let's see if Arnaldi can, play, can keep playing behind his delivery just as well as he has so far. Both games, I think he finished the fun return serves, but also even the, uh, yeah, just the rallies behind it were pretty much clinical as well. So, so far, so good. Finds the very corner of the service box here. Once again, the Fizz movement cross court here. Uh, he's not yet out of the woods when it comes to that early rhythm issue that he's been having here so far. I see, I hear some noises in the background which might indicate that someone else is coming on. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry if I didn't sound too enthusiastic, but it is, you know, after midnight and stuff. Fee's trying to go for this exact same drop shot as earlier, although this time the position was definitely a lot tougher. He nets it, and Arnaldi should have an easy hold here again. I guess this return was out too, so indeed, Matteo Arnaldi 4-1 up. I'm watching volley nets against Kennan. I was watching um, Arnaldi against uh, <clears throat> Fies, but I've switched over. 
you decide that Fields is way too poor today and you can't watch him. Okay. Oh, that was interesting. Seems like I'm still on the stream. John disappeared for a second, but um, yeah, of course, he's going to be back, I would assume. Keen was asking about are there any other two handers such as Berrettini and Songa that can hit one handed winners? Um, I think a lot of players have hit, like, you know, just on occasion one handed winners despite being two handers. Um, let's try to think of examples. Martin Fucovic has a few shots like that. Um, Australian Open, I think, last year, but also I forced, I forced him um, hit it live against, uh, who was that? Huntman, maybe, in Bratislava. Yeah, Huntman in Bratislava in 2022. I remember Jerzy Janowicz one-handed backhand pass against Arol Mayo in Kozerki. Also, I've seen that, uh, you know, in person. Uh, but I think a lot of two-handed backhand players have, like, you know, on occasion tried in a situational shot to hit a one-hander. But, um, well, some will be well more well-known for that than others. Obviously, you mentioned Berrettini and Songa. I think Berrettini is its kind of like, yeah, Fucovic or someone like that who, like, you know, does that from time to time, but he's not going to be going for it as a tactic. Whereas Songa was actually, like, yeah, he was coming up with a lot of one-handers, just, yeah, lots of shots that he was more comfortable on that side. So Steve Johnson, Johnson I guess, you never knew if, if to call him a two-hander or a one-hander because he made um, the switch a few times in his career. Oh, it's definitely more a temptation if you have rubbish backhand, but but also yeah, there are just there are just that that was the case for Tsonga really, but um, yeah, there are just shots that are simply easier if you get that more more reach from the one hand there, or most you're gonna see the like passes on the run and stuff. That's that's how well maybe not on the run, but that's how Berrettini hit it in Phoenix last week. Um, Fulcovic the shot against Hanfman I mentioned that's a pass on the run. Janovic, the one against Mayo that I mentioned, that's also a pass on the run. Like, that's really mostly when you're going to get it. Like, no one is going to be switching in a normal uh, neutral position in the rally, right? That's, I mean, that's not a thing. Like, if, if you were. Matteo did it today as well. Today as well? Oh, okay. Yeah, like, if, if, yeah. if you're going to. Yeah, doing, yeah, which I think is where. That... Doing it, um... mm -hmm. which, which I think is where what? That's where that came from, that that uh, suggestion. Oh, I, I hope not. I hope Keen was just uh, remembering Phoenix last week because, well, ATP 1000? Oh. <laughs> and we know this Miami is a warm up anyway for Estoril. <clears throat> I saw you said it. Yeah, kind of. I mean, Joao Fonseca, for example, he's in Estoril and he's not in Miami. I mean, what does that say about Miami? You know? Yeah, he's in. He's uh, so he's a challenger. Is he out there? No, I mean he he is in Estoril, you know, as well. He is in a challenger this week, but you know. Oh, he's, okay, yeah. He's I wasn't sure if he was out there already. There, uh, he's he's playing somewhere. I don't know where he's playing right yeah, now. Yeah, but yeah, I saw yeah, he had a win today. Yeah, he's playing in As Asuncion. Yeah. Ah, okay, Asuncion. Mm -hmm. According to Nerlan, he's switching back and forth. Nerlan is a Russian speaker as well. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, I think he might have written something in Cyrillic, uh, but I, yeah, I don't know if I knew that or if I'm just sort of now remembering it now that you said it. But I, th I think he might have written something mm. in the chat in Cyrillic before, but I'm not positive. I'm a Russian. A volley nets has a break at the beginning of the second. <laughs> yeah. I can understand the letters. I can't understand the words. Does that count as knowing the language? I could say basic. Oh, I knowledge. see. Basic knowledge. <laughs> yeah, that's the term. I had it at my, at my uh, I actually had a course from Russian at my university, but um, yeah, it did not go that well, at least for me. Were you pumped by Andy Murray uh, and uh, bowling back the years today? <laughs> tricky question, <laughs> tricky question. How to say it, how to say it. Um, no, I mean, uh, I watched a bit of that match, but obviously Matteo was 
from like middle of set two was really struggling. And he did like yeah. come out in the second set, hitting some more aggressive returns and generally mm -hmm. staying on top of the pot point a little bit more. So, you know, he deserves some credit for it. At the very next. You know, last year when they played in Basel, of course, it was like three and a half hours, and Echeverri is one of the few players who can actually beat Mare in a scenario like this. Uh, the problem is that Echeverri is just coming back from an injury, and yeah, we just don't know how he's going to be physically at all. So, Yeah. But yeah, that's kind of one of the seats that you want to draw right now, for sure. And by the way, I was saying earlier that Arthur Fuse will not be switching to down the line in such spots. And actually he does, although given that he's low 40 down on Arnaldi's serve, maybe it was a little easier for him to commit. But he does, and he finds the backhand down the line winner anyway. Is there, a, is there an issue with Fuse at the moment, like the last four months? Is he, is he sort of, is he focused? Is he okay? Is he... I mean, he's not playing well, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's had a few performances here or there. I mean, I think we can say Antwerp was definitely still, you know, right? I mean, Antwerp was still good, right? Then I think yeah. after Antwerp, he went to Paris. He had that terrible match with Altmaier, and he says he's, like, kind of tired and done with the season. Sure, okay. He goes to Jeddah as well. He was okay there, but nothing special, obviously. And, um, and yeah, since the beginning of the new season, I mean, he's had a few decent results, sure, the Auckland semis, but did he really play that well there? I don't think so. And there was also, of course, Indian Wells right now, which probably was his best event so far, but kind of given the court profile you, you expected. There is, like, you know, it, it's not time to be worried yet, I guess, but there are some doubts sort of lingering at the moment. Yeah, for mm. sure. Um, and it's actually deuce now, uh, so maybe that back and down the line that Fizz went for well, is not going to be inconsequential after all. It's yeah, I mean, he definitely he, he's definitely like the player with more to lose today, I would say, yeah, because yeah. Arnaldi loses this match and, you know, it, it's fine, like, he's still on, a, on the right trajectory, if you may, but Fizz has had such heights already. Uh, in 2018, well, 2018. <laughs> I wasn't sure if to say 2023 or as a, as an 18 year old, and I just said 2018 instead. But yeah, in in 2023, of course, he's had such heights already that, um, well, for him, it's like kind of you know, just he just needs to follow it up. Arnaldi on the main tour, he's had like what one semi final or something like that. Like, it, it's perfectly fine for him to lose a few times in the opening round right now for Fils. It's kind of getting a bit desperate if he does. Yeah, I mean, six love to Fonseca. I know Fonseca was like lights out, but also he's that was kind of a weird decision to go to Latin America in the first place, and one that he has said since that you know he kind of maybe regrets it, doesn't think he'll do it again. It came out worse than it than you could sort of imagine it on paper. You know, he he's a good clay player. Obviously, he won Lyon last year. Uh, the conditions in the Golden Swing tend to be at least in a few of these events a little maybe faster, a little more um, suited to attacking players than the ones in Europe, maybe. So it didn't seem like a horrible idea. I don't think he was trying to vulture points or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it just didn't seem like a horrible idea, and of course, it just came out all wrong. So, uh, you know, I would I would like to kind of, and he probably would like to kind of forget about the golden swing. <laughs> the problem is that if he loses today, we kind of won't be able to. Uh, yeah. In Indian Wells, yeah, he 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 really like was an inspired, very different version of himself. Only thing he can really regret is like not pushing Casper more. <laughs> Because it wasn't a great, it wasn't a close match, uh, but but yeah, here it's a loss that will kind of hurt him despite having such a good opponent, you know. He he, but yeah, I guess that's kind of what the the golden swing did to him, right? That um, because of that, we're now looking at feats like really needing some wins, despite him having such a tricky round one foe, and uh, yeah, just not being certain of a win at all, even if he plays well. Hmm. 
Nurland's asking if Volley Nets is getting enough attention. I think she's getting some. Maybe, maybe Navarro is getting a little bit more. I mean, you know, Navarro is in the top 20, right? Yeah. Or like next to the top 20. I actually don't know if she's, or, is she already in the top 20? I think yeah, she's, she's 20. She's thereabouts anyway. She's dead 20, I think. Okay. So, you know, the, the disparity between their attention is probably a good idea. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Volinets was actually for the past few years, you know, I don't know, like three or four years ago, she was the one getting a lot more attention than Navarro, for sure. Navarro going the college route and Volinets kind of being there as one of the main prospects for the States, as in like, you know, you know the big names that they were giving wildcards to. But um, yeah, she just hasn't really developed into a, main tool force let's say you know someone who's gonna grab the big wins Emma Navarro obviously kind of did the, the other thing and I guess Navarro up until really February or March was not getting any traction or attention even her rise was like strictly WT 125s for, for a while and, and even 100ks so yeah it's a, it's a bit of a weird career but I would say that, yeah, the disparity between their attention is probably justified with the results, simply. Yeah. Um, Damien, how far do you think Dane Sweeney can climb in the rankings? I really recommend his YouTube channel called Life on the Tour. It's very good. Um, well, Keen, I think you will agree with me if I tell you that the honest answer is probably not that far. I mean, <laughs> he is super fast. Like, he can rival Alex Demino, he can rival Gael Monfils in a... 50 meter race or whatever but uh, the quality of his shots is lacking and well you can only go as far like you know as far as i don't even know where uh, with that came but um yeah i don't think it's the highest of ceilings and i think his results if you sort of look at them carefully they also kind of tell you that you know it's it's been very hard for him to get quality wins and he's kind of ranked pretty high because of scheduling himself right or like you know even being from that part of the world where you get a lot of weaker challengers in australia and asia i mean you know mark Portman's, of course is always the, the the main example of that sort of staying around 150 140 in the rankings for years because of asia australia challenger results so yeah, I, I don't think that Sweeney is going places, really. What about Martin Dam Jr.? It's a more interesting talent to me. I know it's just, you know, big serve, lefty, but kind of all you need to do in this sport sometimes. Like, it's a, it's a great recipe. He definitely I love, has I love the, court, the court name, Butch Buchholz. <laughs> yeah. Um. Do we know who Butch Buchholz is or was? I don't. I don't know. Anyway, go on, Martin. Martin. Uh, Dan. I mean, a few years ago, everyone was crazy about him, you know, and that basically, if if he's not in the top fifty in a few years, something has gone wrong. He's kind of slowed down in that sense, but if you think about it, he hasn't. Like he's like what twenty, twenty one. So it's not like he's actually not developing well, and um, yeah, I mean, he just serves huge he's got a big game and that's kind of it but i think at some point that has to result in a top top 100 spot like it's it's just kind of impossible for it not to and um yeah i mean i don't think he's people you know kind of want to see a new Eastner in him in that you know they want to hate him because he can't move or something like that but you know i think he's more fun to watch for that than, than john Eisner. I, I, yeah very and fine Arnaldi. win, very fine win today for sure. Arnaldi is um fun for him and his fans right now because he's got some set points. Yeah, other than that one brief lapse of concentration, he was four two four D love up on serve, then he then it gets the deuce. He hasn't really been able to threaten his uh, serve, and you know it's not that Arnaldi is like serve botting or something, but of course with he's losing ninety percent of baseline rallies, it's very hard to break. So um 40-15 now, but still two more set points 
And uh, of course, at the same time, you know, it's not like Arnaldi has a weak serve, so maybe he can just find something here and get over the line. Kind of disappointing so far, definitely this match, but that's not Arnaldi's fault in the slightest. Um, Kennan's got the break back, so the comeback is on. It's funny how she looks away when she's serving. The no look serve. If he's actually saves one more set point, so it's just one more coming. So it's like one of his best rallies of the match too. Um, early on, there were a few shots which like he wasn't really in position for, uh, but he somehow got them over the net. But eventually, actually, just really survived against Arnaldi trying to spread the court just sort of with more flatter pace. He uh, countered that one forehand on the run. He hit that back and to clean it up. It's yeah, it's progress. You know, it gives you gives you some hope that the second set will be more competitive or maybe he can still fight for this one this point could be crucial and he misses a forehand inside out to give Arnaldi the set so 6-3 for the Italian Kenan's by the way the no look serve I'm, I'm sure her father wanted to look away at that point I saw him in the crowd looking very troubled and um Volinets has got the break again so no will be happy <coughs> Yeah, Feast Arnaldi. Um, what's the way back for Feast? Stop making a hundred on first errors of the ground. Like, yeah, I mean, really, just find better timing. I mean, he's made eleven unforced errors on the forehand, right? The, the set um, in nine games. You know, it's kind of impossible to win like that, unless you're at the same time hitting, you know, the same amount of winners or similar at least. Of the baseline 2015 to Arnaldi, you know, it's not that easy, but also returning, like Arnaldi's almost 50% of, of Arnaldi's serves are unreturned. So that also kind of tells you, you know, where the problems lie with how erratic he's been on the forehand side and with how he just cannot really make returns. The umpire is showing a troubled look as, um, Kennan and her father exchange one or two words, let's say. I wonder if there's ever like a finance, not, well, even the big players, they can be careful with money. I wonder if there's a financial thing where they think, you know what, what's the point in spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars on a coach when we can just do it ourselves? For for millionaires like them, probably it's not really a thing. But for... you wouldn't think so. But millionaires can be careful too. That's true. Some say that this is how they become millionaires, right? <laughs> and coaches in tennis, it's a it's a funny thing, you know. In terms of we don't really know their value. We look at coaches come and go, and we look at the results. And that's about it. Yeah, 90, 95% of the time that is the case. That's why I was like very strongly, well, advocating. I can't say I was very strongly advocating, I guess, because, you know, my voice doesn't matter. My vote doesn't matter in this. But that's why I was like very strongly in favor of uh, Darren Cahill and Simone Ivanotti getting that Coach of the Year award last year for Sinner. And, you know, people, including Djokovic and Ivan Isevic, you know, they were after that they like criticized the fact that Goran didn't get it despite his player getting free uh, oh, slams and number one but like you know Djokovic can kind of coach himself and with Sinner it's a very rare case where we see the impact of the coach despite not being part of the team and and yeah that's 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 rare and um, I think um, definitely for the most part we really don't know that much about what's going on behind the scenes and how good a coach actually is sometimes in in an interview they kind of show that they don't know nothing <laughs> mm -hmm. or they uh, uh, i didn't know they don't know anything sorry um like uh, brad gilbert recently uh for example when he was talking about coco golf he said some questionable things 
But okay. yeah, I mean, at the same time, he is a coaching legend, you know. So mm -hmm. he must be doing something good. Sometimes I wonder if they can always translate their ability to help players improve technically, whether they can always translate that to the TV. <clears throat> I mean, I think he, he sees himself as a bit more of a, a guru all round in terms of, you know, in, in match tactics and stuff. Yeah. But, but probably, perhaps, his, his real expertise is actually on the practice court. Um, but he has to put up a, a, another side of it. Otherwise, he doesn't have a job in TV. I mean, it depends, too, because, like, if you're, if you're dealing with players at this level, like, 19... 5% of the time, you're not going to be doing any major technical shakeups. Of course, there, there could be a Coco Goff forehand, there, there could be a Hubert Hurkacz forehand and stuff, but like most of the time, you're not really going to tamper with, with that because that would basically mean that for a few months, their results would probably decrease. Then they kind of want to let you go as well. Like, you know, it's not happening for the most, but like you're actually going to be focusing on the image stuff more probably maybe on the mental side of things as well some coaches um so yeah it's it, it's definitely very tough to judge anything unless we have like a very clear idea of i don't know magnus norman helping us <laughs> and stuff just kind of turning him into a different player and again like a lot of that could be just stan maybe working something out but even if it wasn't Magnus, then Magnus being there was was definitely like you know big support for Stan and kind of allowed him to have that if space. So. If I coached Novak last year, how many Grand Slams do you think he wins? Three. Mm. He wouldn't listen to you if he you know, <laughs> simply as simple as that. Like he just wouldn't listen at all if he didn't believe that you were right. If he believed that you were right, I also don't think he would actually mess up much because. Even if you told him something pre-match that was like, you know, dead wrong or, I don't know, something that would actually destroy his chances, he would probably just adjust mid-match, I think. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will still be free. And that's not, not to say that Goran isn't, you know, doing, probably doing a great work with him. I mean, yeah, we just can't really estimate its full impact. because how the, the other reason why three is, is, is because it was the only marginal one was the one he lost, you know, and that was that was um, Wimbledon. So do I do I yeah. have a bit a negative enough impact for him not to win the French Open final against Casper Ruud or or City Pass or, or Medvedev? Almost certainly not. Do yeah. I? Does he does he lose to Carlos maybe in four? Maybe, maybe that. Maybe happens. he beats him. Maybe he beats him. Oh yeah. Well, well, I can't do I can't do any worse. He could lose love, love and one, and it wouldn't be any worse in terms of you know finishing runner up and getting the runner up tre check. Yeah, it would be funny if you uh, started coaching someone. It just maybe you would turn out a natural. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of BS involved when you when you're a coach of, of of anyone or any institution. They just have to believe in you. If everybody tomorrow stopped believing in Pep Guardiola, if they all if all the players just didn't believe any of his methods, even if he was doing exactly the same thing. You, you've, you've used that you've used that argument but it's a little different i think in tennis because well first of all you hire that coach right yeah the dynamics okay. different yeah the players don't hire coaches in football or in any team sports really uh whereas here yeah i mean you hire the coach so he's like kind of <laughs> under you whereas in football it would actually be the player who is under the supervision, under the management of the coach. So like the power balance is completely different. The hierarchy is completely different. And um, that definitely is a, is a huge twist. Sometimes I think we, we kind of forget about this as well, that like, after all, it's the player who hires the coach and like they are kind of, you know, contracted with them, but they also have to be nice to the player, you know, because otherwise they would just lose their job. Yep. Definitely, yeah. So, like, if they're, like, super harsh and, I don't know, uh, maybe force them to, like, you know, try to force them at least to, like, break away from their routines or do something that they're not comfortable with, it's like, you're gone. You're, you're just going to get fired. So, it's probably limiting the coaches in some, some ways as well. But, I mean, there's no real way around it. That's why I also thought that, um, who is that... Um, 
well, maybe not precisely that, but there was that thing with uh, Kim Van Zhenk and Vim Fisset, right? When he left her. Mm -hmm. And she was like super angry about it. Like, you know, it's it's literally someone leaving his place of work to go to another, which has given him a better offer. Like, there's it's not much to uh, be angry about there. Like, it's we kind of make it out, make it out to be a little bigger than it is sometimes, you know, the player coach relationships. Whereas after all, it's yeah, it's literally like any other work in many ways. Of course, we used held to start the second set. There were a few spotty errors, absolutely. That forehand at 3015, kind of still remember it. And I, uh, well, did not make me want to scream out of joy and dance around my room. However, 4030 now uh, for Arnaldi, uh, at least feeds his held and has this opportunity to apply some pressure if he can. Hmm. Interesting one from Arnaldi serving volleying on the second serve and actually getting some really good first touch here. Uh, Fils, Fils return was perfectly fine, dipping low over the net, but Arnaldi catches it perfectly. So one game all. I think in that uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy interview that you were uh, playing before the, the stream started, there was uh, David some Sam. talk David about Sam. it too. Oh, that was that wasn't Craig or Shannon. Okay, okay. No, you mean the stuff about psych, sort of tennis psychology and. So magic. there were two. So there were two different interviews. Uh just one, I think. Today, just one. Uh, just because talking about tennis you... psychology. I sometimes do play Craig or Shannon. Because yeah. sometimes you play Craig, and I, I guess I just mix them up. Then, so it okay. was David Samuel today. Okay. Today about psychology, match points, how to stay in the moment, that kind of thing. Interesting. Hmm. That's the one you heard, right? <clears throat> I guess. I was thinking about the Wimbledon Feather, you know. Yeah, I thought that would catch your attention, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, it was a bit of a weird take to me. And that's oh, why the, I made, made... The, the, um, uh I thought as well you might react to that. The uh, serve volley suggestion, you mean? Serve volley both, yeah. Because yeah. Um, maybe that's why I thought it was Craig. Because when I hear a take like this, I was like, yeah. Okay, I mean, it's Craig Roshansi, and he works with Djokovic, you know, sure. But, um, okay, David Samuel, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. not that I know David Samuel. I kind of feel like I do, you know, because I've I've seen him a billion times, and basically, you know, I, I've watched a lot of Liam Brody matches, so I kind mm -hmm. of feel like I do, even though I never, you know, even said a word to that guy. But, um, yeah, that's it. That, that, that's interesting. I was I wasn't expecting that. No, personally, like I, you know, I, I maybe get what he means if he puts in a couple of quality first serves, right? But obviously, that wasn't the case. And Did, uh, what what happened? Did he were they were they were they either of them t first serves? The first was definitely not, and it was like very close to being an ace, but it wasn't. I would have to see the second again. I don't remember. Okay. I think the second might have been in, but he just doesn't capitalize on that. But. Um, yeah, I mean, if you put in two quality first serves, like if you really like place them, you know, pretty close to the lines, sure. But uh, I think there are, well, I mean, I don't think there are many players who would have done that in that spot, you know, just basically speed around the net. On both points. I think Dave might be a bit old school and, and has been obviously working with players since the early 80s, I think. Um, obviously, growing up through or working through Becker and Edberg and all that stuff. So I just wonder if, if he thinks about serve volley a bit more than lots of other coaches do. Um, that no, maybe he, he, he must have, you know, sort of watched the development of the game and must have seen his oh, players get burned by just, yeah, quality returns with modern technology a lot. But, um, I mean, yeah, that's just an interesting take that um, definitely I was... Maybe, maybe that's why I went to Craig because that kind of felt like... Um, yeah, that just kind of felt like a natural thing, I guess, for him to talk about that because of uh, the Djokovic connection and stuff. But okay. Oh, okay, yeah. That was, um, uh, yeah, just 
didn't know how David Samuel sounds like. The but um, he is a friend of the show, so indeed, yeah. The um, uh, the older ball kids. I don't know how to describe them. The ball ball people, uh, I guess, mm -hmm. in Miami who appear from time to time are kind of amusing. Um, I mean, really old. Like there was a fifty-year-old dude just on my screen just now. Um, yeah, there there was this huge thing like a year or two ago. Who was it? Like maybe Jensen Brooksby who. Uh, had to apologize to the bold person. It was like a 40, 50 year old guy. <laughs> Ken and, and Volinitz are back on surf, by the way. Um, it's a real humdinger, this one. I just feel that Feast can be a bit laissez-faire sometimes, you know, four love down to Fonseca and he's like, yeah, all right, this set is done. Golden swing. Well, yeah, I'll see how it goes. I mean, he made the final, didn't he, in, um, in the next gen? Yeah. And all the metrics that they, they showed before, he was like top speed, movement, strength, whatever. You know, they had all that that stuff before um, before their matches, which is, fun, which is interesting. Yeah, but then Artur Kazao actually uh, beat him in everything. Oh, really? Yeah, because Kazao was an alternate for the next gen finals, and they also brought him in for that competition. Uh, for the base camp thing, or however it was called, and Kazo actually beat Fields in everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Kazo as well, I think, is out of hospital now. I haven't heard anything, so I don't know. Yeah. I didn't even know he was in hospital for that long, but I think he was in hospital overnight. I think usually when you faint, they like kind of force you to spend the night in the hospital, right? That's kind of how, what I saw in movies, I guess. Keith's asking me this question. I think I have seen it. Yeah, I think I have. It's, it's an ambidextrous kid who's just switching hands. Yeah, Teodor Davidov. Mm -hmm. Is he from like Kazakhstan or somewhere? He's from Bul Bulgaria, but what? I think he might be playing for the States. Oh, okay. He's definitely like Bulgaria States. I think he's a dual citizen. I think he. Uh, let me check that actually, but yeah, he plays for the States, but he's from Bulgaria. I played tennis today on carpet. Ooh. Yeah, but we're, neither of us serve well enough to make it like a, you know, six comfortable holes. Well, maybe not comfortable holes, but like I, I've heard at least, you know, I haven't played on carpet as you know. I've heard that like even amateur players, you know, basically serve bots. There. I don't, I don't come anywhere near a serve bot, but I, I do hold more often. That's for sure. Any active pros with two handed forehands? There was this Kim guy from South Korea, but I, I mean, I don't know if you want to count him as active, but. He was like fifth, 500 in the rankings. I don't, I don't know if he's active. The, uh, the myth about Rafa being basically urged to switch hands, which is just that, a myth, does stem from something in that he did, uh, as a kid, very young kid, play with a two-handed forehand. That is true. I mean, it also stems from the fact that he is right-handed, but plays tennis left-handed. Right? Yeah, yeah. He's not right-handed for everything, but I think he's right-handed for a lot of things, yeah. Well, most you know, whatever. He writes with his right hand. I guess that's the one you mm -hmm. always yeah, yeah. look at, right? Like when you when you try to tell if you're right. And I think it right does hand. give him a big advantage on the backhand. Yeah, Being possibly. Right hand, yeah. Possibly, yeah. Although you, you could argue that for a lot of years he kind of wasn't using it. <laughs> that's some phenomenal footwork for Nadi here, sliding into that last winner and yeah, just getting it if he's unable to hit his way through. I tried. Maybe, uh -huh. Go on. In, in no, a fair... Go on. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that maybe Matteo Arnaldi would have won the base camp competition if, they, if he was there that year. Who would? Who would on the, on the tour, like, 
Yeah, I mean, Djokovic obviously years ago might have stood a chance in certain categories, but I still think yeah, speed too much, too much focused on speed and like even even the the jump or whatever there was. Like, I'm not sure Djokovic would be that good at that. On feast would probably be really good a few years ago in, in, all, in all of this, right? Alcaraz, Alcaraz, yeah, sure, sure. Need and jump, sure. Maybe strength too. I actually think like some of the guys that were there, like. It's hard to get. It's hard to find someone better. Like you know, this particular mm -hmm. year, this particular group of juniors, yeah. Yeah. like yeah, Kazov is like that's probably one of the top guys. The minor would be really good in the speed ones, obviously, but the jump probably not so much. And by the I... way, I was about to say also that I will be playing tennis tomorrow. However, not oh, okay, on, not on carpet. What surface? Indoor hard? Clay, clay. Clay, oh, you've got, oh, great. You've got the opportunity to play on clay. Oh, okay. Just because in Germany, they're very slow to opening up the courts. I will be playing in an indoor clay court. Indoor clay, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. They haven't opened the courts yet either. The, the oh, okay. So I, um, uh, a bit foolishly, uh, and I was actually just talking about it just before it happened. Uh, I tried in a fairly normal rally but normal rally on carpet to do a run around forehand today when it would have been a lot easier to take the backhand and i fell as a result oh yeah no 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 big deal the fall was fine it didn't hurt at all but i fell because of the whole nature of it was just not there for the run around i think it's on camera as well i'll see if i can dig it out i would love to see that <laughs> yeah, 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 and I and maybe maybe the maybe the camera will tell me something different. You know, it's interesting because I felt convinced that it happened because of the fact that I was running around the backhand, and funny enough, I think I even ran a bit too far around it, and then maybe just tried to whatever. Anyway, I'm just trying to remember it, but I wonder if the the video footage will back it up. Um, I'm sure on a clay court it would have been fine. Yeah, if this is like barely hanging on here uh loses this loses another rally here love 30 down once again arnaldi kind of inviting him forward and just misses that slice approach the whole match has been like yeah with all over the place from him that's pretty smart though he's fighting He's not ready to give it up. Yeah, I mean, mostly I mostly play in clay because it's just, you know, what we have here for the most part. Um, hard courts outdoors, you're not going to find a lot. And basically, um, yeah, basically, otherwise, you just have clay, 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 clay. I have this hard court pretty close to me, but it's like even slower than clay, probably. So it's yeah. it's like Indian Wells. <laughs> I was going to say Indian Wells, yeah. Lovely winner there from uh, Kenan. Kenan is really fighting now. She's just two points away from the set. In fact, she's going to have a set point after that mean return. That's a pretty incredible lob that Arnaldi just found. And he's going to have a break point now because of that. From the camera, I was unable to tell if it was going to land in, but now that they show us the replay, it's actually pretty safely in the court as well. So breakpoint for Arnaldi and this is definitely looking like a vital moment given how Fils has been a little irrelevant on return so far. And Can obviously he misses the plus one back end into the net. So and Arnaldi bits the break. So yep. in the exact same moment. Just like Kenyon or Volinet's Kenyon. Kenan won the set, yeah. Oh, Kenan won the set, okay. And Nerlan is saying Kenan is very lucky. Maybe we're not talking about Kenan enough, Nerlan. Does does Kenan get the attention she deserves? 
last year there was this uh part of the season i guess when people were saying that that yeah canyon you know she's gonna be back and stuff i don't know maybe i always thought that that yeah i always just thought that you know her winning a slam and making a final in the same year was a little much but quirky yeah someone has to and uh she did very well to get there uh, in the meantime, also, Trevisan retired against Hunter, and we also have Osaka leading Cocheretto 6-3, 4-2, pretty convincingly. I think that, um, yeah, I, I, there's no way I'm going to stay up for Mikkelsen Klein, so my watching will end today with Fils Arnardi. But I that's will, fine. I'll probably see this one too. How is Osaka getting on? Well, oh. Six three, four three, up a set and a break. Yeah. yeah. She's someone who didn't quite go as far as I thought she would in uh, in uh, uh, Indian Wells. I thought she was going to do big things there. Here in in Miami, even though I think this is a slightly taller order under normal circumstances for Eager, I actually see the competition being less i just I, I just can't see how eager doesn't win this tournament unless i mean her, her her draw is a little bit easier than than say for example in australia or in in even in Indian wells that in australia maybe but is it easier than in indian wells i mean she's playing georgie in the second round like you know a textbook opponent who's just gonna take your racket out of your hands and if she's landing all the balls there's nothing you can do you've got nushkova again in the third round maybe Unless it's Timo Fieva. You've got Alexandrova in the fourth round. Like, I mean, these are all threats if you're coming off a title and you potentially don't need to be uh, you know, at your very best. There's also the problem, well, problem. I mean, on this court, Rybakina or Sabalenka would actually have a shot at her. I don't think they would be hurt in their mouths last week, but they would have beaten her lot in their mouths last week. But, um, I guess yeah. it's the doubt surrounding the two players for, for obviously a million different reasons. Yeah, with Sabalenka, I was I was sort of even questioning yeah. myself whether to add her into this or not. I mean, so, but even even the tennis with Sabalenka, I mean, it's just a bit um, hit and miss at the moment. Maybe more miss than hit. And then Rebecca, I mean, what what kind of health is she in? I mean, she she pulls out of Indian Wells, but then she's practicing again. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, both I of them caught the is playing Towson as well tomorrow. That's oh, okay. And both are on the opposite side of the draw as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. She can only play one of them. Co- Coco um, uh, is on, uh, I guess, is in the same half as she is as, um, as Eager. Yeah, I'm not treating her as a serious rival, though. No, I mean, like, no, no. Not, not for Sviantek, at least. I'm not saying for the rest of the draw, but like for Sviantek, for the most part, yeah. Eighty percent of her matches are not going. Of, of their matches are not going to be competitive. I think I've got a, a weird, um, a weird uh, semi-final lineup. I've got Eager and then Azarenko. I think um, maybe Osaka. I can't remember. It's it's not. It's not normal. <laughs> it's not Vanch Bold top four. Oh yeah, so Osaka against Fiontech and Ostapenko against Azarenka. So what what is it? Is your bracket or? Yeah, my bracket. Yeah, I've got Igor against Naomi and Yelena against Victoria. Yeah, I think Fiontech Osaka is a popular pick, probably. Um, like I, I think a lot of people would have the, exactly that semi. The other one is. Like, I've got yeah sure both can reach it but I I, I guess there's just no consistency in no, general no. on the tour right now so like it's hard to predict I think Azarenka was a bit of a trendy pick for Indian Wells too and of course that did not <laughs> um out. I've got Iga beating Emma Navarro in the quarters Alexandrova in the fourth round Noskova in the third and of course Camilla Georgi in the second Pagula versus for back in the final said Nerland. I wonder if Nerland has ever had Eager like winning a tournament in, in his predictions. 
Nolan, you should join the uh, the bracket. I'll post it in the live chat. Just give me a second. All looking rather comfortable for Arnaldi right now. Yeah, I mean, he's still playing great and feels just hasn't been able to produce anything on return, you know. He just had to be super clean behind his own delivery. Hasn't been so far. And uh, it's getting quite rough. Butch Buchholz, Earl Butch Buchholz was an American tennis player, apparently. Oh, let's see. Should we know him? Uh, I like the name, at least. Volley Nets was the one who took a lengthy uh, break at the end of that second set. Oh, I had the uh, pleasure of watching Simona Halep against uh, Badosa yesterday. I see Badosa's match with uh, Sabalenka has been put back a day, as in, like, I think the half of the draw that they should be playing in is, is tomorrow. Badosa and Sabalenka has been uh, moved to Friday. Uh, because Sabalenka asked, asked for it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So that's what yeah. I'm saying. So they should have played tomorrow. But I wasn't even sure if Badosa, because Badosa was um, having a physical issue in the, the last game of the match, or maybe in the last game and a half, and it's like, can she just get through this game and a half? Because it looked like uh, she sort of jumped and it seemed like she had an Achilles issue or something similar. I'm not sure about these exceptions being made, honestly. I know it's a popular decision, but, um, well, whoever wins that match, and let's imagine it's not Sabalenka, let's imagine mm -hmm. it's Badosa, mm -hmm. then she won't get a day off for the third round. But they are very good friends, aren't they? And maybe Badosa was like, you know what, I need another day for the injury, that's what I was saying. It's possible Paola was okay with it, yes, definitely. I'm not okay with... Um with the uh, top players over the years the big three is the, the the prime example of you know getting to choose when they play not really like you know they they only chose when they play maybe sometimes with the day like the time of day you know time of day yeah yeah. yeah no that's what i'm talking different. i know it's, I, I even think the time the, of day the, you know this is a big exception like you know it's not it's not just someone coming up and saying oh i want to play friday so you know, yeah. No, but I'm just thinking about the time of day for the big three. Uh, I, mean... I, I think Rafa as well would often play second. So the second half, he would be, uh, he would have sometimes enough influence at the French Open, for example, to say, look, I want to play my first match on, on day two, not day one. I know now it's a bit different because they start on a Sunday and it's spread over three days. But for so many years, Novak never playing in the daytime. We saw Roger react very annoyingly once when he, he was asked about it. And... Yeah, when she played on court one, right? At Wimbledon. I remember this, this question was asked in New York, I think. Oh, okay. There was also a thing when he played on court one at Wimbledon. I know there was a case when, when Rafa played on centre court at Wimbledon and I think Ash Barty played on number one, and there was a bit of fuel as well. Barty played on number two, I think, even or something. Oh, really? Like that, yeah. Okay. Volley Nets just lost a break point. Uh, she was up a break point and then dumped a backhand wide. Yeah. Anyway, I just, I guess, I just don't see a problem really. I mean, you know, it's, it's after all, it's still not the players who are deciding, but like the networks and stuff. Like, whatever was best for the tournament money-wise would also be the priority rather than keeping Nadal happy because Nadal is always going to be going to be playing your event, you know, if you're a yeah. star. Yeah, but the player power within tennis is phenomenal. And, you know, they can inquire about stuff and 
ask for something, but if it's not convenient for the event, they're not going to get it. Sometimes though it's 50, 50, sometimes it doesn't really matter. I mean, there was also the situation during COVID when the, I think the top four players, which include Dominic team, I think at the time, uh, for the Australian Open basically got their own, they had their own, um, they could fly out earlier. They could, they could, um, have their own situation in Brisbane. I think it was, um, they got some big preferential treatment that year. Djokovic team, Nadal and Djok and uh, maybe Daniel Medvedev. I don't see fees. Doesn't look like Feast is going to be making a comeback. There's been virtually nothing to suggest that. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Has Feast had a break point? I don't think so. There was yeah. a deuce in the opening set. That was the one where he was love 40 down and then he got it to deuce. But otherwise, he's like barely winning points on return. In fact, so far, he's won eight of them in nine games so yeah keen next event is esterville yeah esterville i'm waiting on barcelona and then it'll be grass i think No plans for, for Rome or Stuttgart or Munich. Stuttgart is looking um, like there's a lot of top 10 players that are going there. WTA. That's the same week as Barcelona. Yeah, I'm 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 so ATP sided that I was like thinking, Stuttgart, wait. I mean, that's a grass event. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, W at ATP five hundred. Yeah. Then I of course re uh, two fifty, but then I <laughs> then I then I realized yeah that the Porsche indoor whatever yeah uh, whatever it's called is also there. That's just, that's actually an event I usually watch quite a lot. So it's um it's it's exciting in terms of players that will be playing there it's just Stuttgart indoors or Barcelona outdoors uh location climate for me I mean Barcelona is not super super hot it's not like Andalusia at that time of year but it's still warmer than Stuttgart yeah King uh it's uh Lisbon's a great city and it's half an hour away Ooh. Any challenger events on the horizon, as in attending? Uh, not until Portugal. After that, in April, um, I might visit Ostrava again. Definitely one of the 175s. Um, probably one of the French ones this year, because I, it was Cagliari for me last time, so probably Aix-en-Provence or Bordeaux. And uh, we already have the calendar for June as well. So um, it is the same like last year or at least very similar like last year. So indeed, my plan should be to go to Serpiton and then Poznan in June. Okay. And um, yeah. I think we have a match point right on the feast serve. Yes, indeed. Fields dumps a drop shot. He's like quite frustrated right now. When he found a big serve for 2015, he was just, you know, why now? Why only now? There's going to be a point as well. And that in this match usually results in Fields losing. He hits this very short shot, just like completely by accident and wins the point. 
on the back of that. So for now he survives, but. I've just seen Ken and do something I did a few times today, which is just dump a short ball in the net. It's so annoying. I think it's difficult to imagine either of these players really doing big things. It's, it, it's difficult to, to see. I mean, I remember that Ken and Muguruza final quite clearly, and she was kind of playing at the peak of her powers, particularly from the moment she was facing three break points. But uh, it's difficult to imagine, yeah. No lamb won't be very happy with that. I mean, Volinets, sure, but like, you know, Canyon. Ah, but even Volinets, I mean. Grand least... Slam champion, Grand Slam runner up, number <laughs> four in the world. But I don't see Volinets really. I don't see that, you know, anything like top 10 or anything like that happening. Yeah, it's very hard to imagine that. Did Sofia Canyon also do well in San Diego? the fifth slam uh, <laughs> last year she got to the final yeah yeah and i think she may have been hampered physically in the final i'm not sure i don't know i definitely didn't watch it who would, who would be watching San Diego? i know i know and <laughs> even less who would go no I, I think i was at some event that week but i don't remember I, I don't think i was really able to watch but i don't know if it would have changed anything either <laughs> <laughs> so We are using the fact that Vanch is definitely not watching the stream at the moment. Oh, yeah. I've seen a picture of him in the in the stadium, yeah. Yeah, so. Lisbon is Keen's favorite city. Yeah, yeah sure. it's like 20, 20 kilometers from Lisbon or something like that. I have not been to Portugal, so it's going to oh, be the first, nice. the first one for me. Have you, um, are you familiar with um, a guy who's been on the stream a couple of times, but not with you? Um, I met him in Madrid last year. Basel, his name is. He's got an accreditation as well. He has an Arabic podcast. Ba um, who? Basel. You might, he's in the WhatsApp group. Really? Yeah. He must have, like, you know, been quiet. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty quiet. He, he's, he's not super vocal. But anyway, he, I, I don't know how I came across him exactly, but before we met in Madrid, no, because we met in Madrid, but I already knew him by then, uh, if you like, or knew him. Uh, I guess just because from the podcast world or, or YouTube world, even if it's a completely different language. Maybe he liked a few of my Basel should find you. Hmm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I might have seen you doing something with... He looks like Goran Ivanisevic. He really does. He's a he's, he's a bit shorter, but um... maybe the photo that I have him uh, on that he has on WhatsApp maybe doesn't show it because he has a like hat on. Well, not a hat, but like a winter cap, whatever. Okay. Anyway, yeah. You'll see. Um, You'll see. So he's in. He's going to be in Estoril. He's also going to be in Estoril. Okay, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what you're trying to say. Exactly. <laughs> Three points away again from closing out the match, Arnaldi this time, of course, on his serve. So given how he's been blasting through his service games so far, he will like his chances. Ugh, especially with this another wild forehand error from Fuse. Things are not looking too bright indeed for the young Frenchman especially along with his most recent performances. Oh. 
Volley Nets and Tennis Sanguine. Kind of funny how they've got tennis related names. Yeah, Volley Nets is definitely pretty funny. I mean, I don't, I don't know a David Football or a Peter Basketball. <laughs> it would be the other way around, you know, with Sanguin. So, so like basketball. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Squash. Shot. Be, I mean, volley nets is kind of two things. Right? Yeah. Some match points for Arnaldi. Yes, indeed. Uh, second serve, I think. Arnaldi uh, feels was like kind of ready to give it up on the previous point. He guessed he, well, Arnaldi didn't make the serve, but now he doesn't put the return over the net. Six, three, six, four. Very comfortable, very clean. A uh, bit of a well, uh, I was just about to say something that wasn't really uh, PG-13, but yeah, uh, a pretty poor performance from the Frenchman for sure. But Arnaldi is a star right now, definitely. I mean, Arnaldi is like on the verge of a big breakthrough result. Will it be here? I don't know. I will have to check who he needs to play in the second round because uh, that will give us a bit of an indication whether this breakthrough result might come here. Give me uh, three minutes and I'll be back. I know the match is over, but if you can give me three minutes, um, talk okay. to that'd be great. There is a question actually I, I, I have, I'm intrigued about from Keen, but if you can hold off on that question as well, that would be cool. Okay, so holding off on the question. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to talk about, something. No, no, I, I'll find something. That's <laughs> easy, easy. Yeah, beautiful performance, really, from Arnaldi again. I don't care how Fizz was erratic, you know, and stuff, but, I mean, Arnaldi, if he's not on the verge of a breakthrough result, then I really don't know what I'm talking about. Like, obviously, he had that Fritz win in Acapulco, but because he still hasn't had, like, a massive major result, like, I don't know, a final in a 250 somewhere or something like that, like, you know, that that's the sort of caliber that I'm talking about. That's the sort of caliber that he's clearly ready for. And he's just sort of waiting around for an opportunity like this. For two, you know, sort of, I have to say that he's not going to be playing that many events like this soon. Uh, his next starts are Monte Carlo, Barcelona. So he's not really going for the 250s. But, well, yeah, that's that's sort of what I'm expecting from him. He's going to play Bublik 50-50. Um, Is that fair? Maybe. If he plays Chapo or Tsitsipas in the third round, I think Arnaldi is the favorite. I think Arnaldi, I don't know if Arnaldi beats Public, but I think he would beat Tsitsipas at the moment, yeah. That's a reasonable expectation to me. <laughs> okay, so that's the question. Interesting. I will have to think about it, but of course, yeah, I will wait with, for, for John. Um... What else do we have left? Naomi Osaka defeated Elisabetta Cocceretto already, so only one women's match going on right now, and that is the last women's singles match of the day with Katie Volinets breaking Sofia Kenin right now to break mm -hmm. to go up to a 3-2 in the deciding set. And there's also, as I mentioned a few times already, a couple of men's matches coming up. Alex Mikkelsen against Lucas Klein and Marcos Giron against Dominic Kepfer. So soon enough, Klein Mikkelsen might be starting. And does that mean that I will try to watch it? Uh, I think I'll just go to bed. Although it's a shame because that's one of the one of, that's one of my favorite round ones for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, public Arnaldi, Shapoval of Tsitsipas. I would love to see Arnaldi Tsitsipas in the third round. I really think that he would uh, have an excellent shot at Steph. And I actually don't know if I have a worst event that I with both that I that I attended. Um, John will probably have an answer since he wanted me to wait with that. But um, I don't know if I really will. To be quite honest with you, I have to think about what I even attended. Maybe maybe that will give me some idea, some insight into my previous experiences in tournaments. Thank you. 
that could be that could be something oh uh, i have a i have a list somewhere i think there recently because i was I was losing myself in it i think i have a list of stuff that i've been to and i just think i'm just thinking about what i enjoyed the least and yeah it's probably gonna be that that makes that makes a lot of sense basically has to be some made to event because every single charger i've been to has been sublime <laughs> if you may but yeah for now john has of course disappeared and i still have to talk about something so i'll keep going um See that Mikkelsen is currently a bit of a favorite over Klein. I don't know if that's right, but it's definitely quite close. Both guys are deadly at the moment and could actually give us some big upsets if they are allowed to. Although I think that section is going to have them facing Talon Greeks, but they can definitely beat him, Mikkelsen or Klein. But then if they play Sinner, of course, yeah, I wouldn't really like their chances. <laughs> that seems a little too tough. Someone is coming back. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. I wasn't quite sure if my microphone had kicked in. In fact, when I was in the shop buying this chocolate milk, which I've just had a craving for in the last seven days. Yeah, I remember you going for, uh, yes, for some, a chocolate milk. A, will, a week ago, somebody mentioned it on the stream or something like that. I don't know who it was. And then I went and bought one. And now this is like the third one in the last week. Anyway, um, yeah, so this question here, I think it's really difficult because I can tell you lots of things that have annoyed me about different events from different perspectives, whether it be a fan or, or working. I don't know if one sticks out for you. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that. And it just has to be main tour experiences, you know, Marseille yeah. or Warsaw, basically. Uh, Marseille was like, I don't know. Like it was one of these events where you enter the press office and you don't feel welcome. Definitely not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people sitting around there, which like don't even leave there that room, and yeah, they just sit there for whatever reason. The yeah. uh, there there was a lot of stupid rules and like chaos when it comes to organization. Mm. Uh, as an example, like the stupid mm. rules, there was this one corridor which was literally just like I don't know one meter long. And I couldn't pass through it to get to the press office, but I had to go around because that one corridor was not, I was not allowed in there due to my, uh, you know, accreditation not being like, you know, uh, organizer or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, that was just like in incredibly idiotic because this was like maybe one, two steps really like that. That was the, the length of that passage. And um, yeah, I didn't really like that too much. Uh, I mean, I, I still enjoyed the tennis obviously, but, as a whole experience, you know, it wasn't, it just sort of told me, okay, I should be traveling to challengers more than yeah. uh, the main tour. And also the, the event in Warsaw, I had, I had my issues with it too. Like the, the way that everything was like so tight and, um, you really couldn't go anywhere. People in the first year didn't even have access to the practice courts in the second set. Also not really, but like that, that should be one of the main things about the event. Like. The, the players had no access to the fan to the uh, sorry the fans had almost no access to the players like mm. almost n none whatsoever the journalists as well like you know you you were kind of like forced to either go through the WTA woman which was a nightmare all the press conferences which were shiontek 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 and that's it really mm. and um, even when when they did something with a foreign player it was like you know Bukhova and only I'm asking the questions like, and then they of course get disappointed with that. Then they, then they, they're not, not going to do anything, uh, later on. So as a whole, like these were some frustrating experience experiences as well. Um, I still went for the second year because well, uh, it's close. Mm -hmm. It's cheap for me. Why wouldn't I, uh, I can do it like one week a year, but, uh, yeah, it, it, both both events were just kind of frustrating to me with how uh, the organization already is like, you know, uh, higher up and like, you know, it's a step above the lower tiers, but that only makes it 
a lot more clunky and only makes it a lot less interesting from anyone's perspective, really, the fan, the journalist, everyone. Like there was one day that I, this one day that I always keep mentioning, which was uh, in the 2022, the clay edition, the semifinals, when we basically got to the venue and of course we watched the matches, it was Garcia and Bogdan advancing to the finals. I don't even remember who they beat, but we watched the matches. And then that lady from the WTA went over to the locker room. She recorded like some uh, quotes from Garcia and Bogdan, and they sent them to us via email. So mm. why were we even there? You know, like yeah. what am I doing there? And of course, it's fine. Like I came there, I watched the matches, I ate dinner. So you know, I'm I'm glad in a way. But at the same time, I just know the pointlessness of the whole thing. And yeah. um, I don't know. To me, it's to me, it's 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 kind of yeah. Just just uh, it's not something that I can simply live with. It's something that I will complain about. And sure, uh, yeah. Basically, I would have to go for the Warsaw. I must say. The there's no one event. And by the way, I am coming at this uh, to be honest with you entirely from the media perspective. I think as a fan. Um, uh, I'd probably have a soft spot for the US Open, perhaps, and then the rest all fall into a, a similar category, let's say, of elitism and, and expense. And anyway, that's the fan bit. But the, the I, I think Keen is probably asking us mainly from our experiences of, of, of doing stuff journalistically. I, I don't, I can't stick, I can't say one, but I can say many issues at one or all of them. And of, a lot of them will be very similar to your frustrations. I mean, what you were just saying to me then reminded me of an event that I wasn't at, but in Dubai, I know that uh, Shrihui uh, wasn't allowed to go to the main court, but could go to the other courts. Even though the main, even if the main court was half empty, it just didn't make sense to me. And on top of that, there was a media day, but was exclusive for, let's say, established media, uh, which is just... I don't know. I don't know. It's just weird. Um, obviously, inside media and established media, if you like, which again is 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 not nice. I don't think, um, and not necessary. Um, that's so. That's Dubai. Um, but yeah, little issues. Uh, at Buenos Aires, I was finding it very difficult to um, to get my questions in at times. And uh, I, I, I decided that, that I didn't mind it if there was an Argentinian player, which was half the draw. I always took a back seat, even if I had a question, even if, if, if I wanted to get involved. And uh, I remember when I finally managed to get a couple of questions in for Carlos, I think, or at least one in for him in the semi-final and maybe Jari after the final. Um, on both occasions, the, the organiser, who'd already promised me a question during those press conferences, that's the other thing that annoyed me. And in the end, he just ran away. He ran away from me as I tried to chase him after the press conference. He really did. He sort of looked in different directions, and I'm like trying to chase him around the press room, saying, what the hell was that all about? And he said, oh, two things he said. First of all, um, there's people that have been coming here for decades, you know, and, and you're new. And I was like, she's about 25 years old. I don't think she was here when she was minus five. Um, and then there was another uh, thing which is like, oh, but we only want questions in Spanish. I said, yeah, that's right. I'm, and I, I was speaking to him in Spanish. I'm like, yeah, I'm here to ask questions in Spanish. That's fine. Anyway, uh, so that's Buenos Aires. Rio was just uh, a communication and organization, I, I guess, is, is the, the theme throughout all of this. And it doesn't matter if it's a 1,000 or a 250. It can be bizarre and weird and odd. And there's all sorts of handshakes and winks and and stuff that's going on. And it's it's left a rather sour taste in my mouth, I have to say, after doing it for a year. It's not all bad. Of course, I wouldn't still be here a year later wanting to attend these tournaments because there's a lot of good stuff going on too. But a lot of gray areas that they don't tidy up. And we've seen, we've seen some of the reaction uh, of the media, but also people on social media about what's been going on around Arena Sabalenka in the last 48 hours and the reaction to that. Well, part of it is just because of an absolutely chaotic organization that don't preempt anything uh, and don't think about what could go on in the press room. And of course, it all depends on who asks these questions in the press room, as opposed to what is asked, which is a problem in life, but but probably uh, exaggerated. But it hasn't exactly answered Keen's event question in terms of the worst event. 
because I'm I'm loving going to Estoril, Barcelona, and Madrid. The first three events, I guess maybe Wimbledon, maybe mm -hmm. Wimbledon is probably the one I would say is probably the worst from from a, a newbie media perspective. Probably that one um, is the one um, that I would say is is the weirdest, the strictest, the least flexible, the the least transparent. Let's go with that um, uh, organize a, a, a event on the calendar that I could think of. Um, either I attended as a fan or even in the media. I, I did it once in the media before uh, chalk and tennis. Yeah, the great moral from me, sort of from this story and looking at uh, Keen's question, was that when I was looking at the list of challengers that I attended, there was nothing that I could come up with. I enjoyed every single one of them. So, do you, uh, when you go to the challenges, is it quite easy to sort of get a private interview? Do you have to go through someone, or do you just? I mean, now you've probably met some of these people a lot over the last few years. I mean, how does how do you manage to to score an interview? Some of these people, as in whom? players ah players no i mean 95 percent of the time you just come up to the players uh, themselves yeah. you know uh there could be like for example cagliari the 175 was a little more organized in that sense that um well basically mm -hmm. i would still come up to the players by myself if they if not for one thing the, the thing was that they uh, you, you, you like didn't have access to where they were leaving the center court from. So if it was an outside court match, sure, I could just talk to them. That's how I did Arno Fatanuki, Taro Daniel. But if it was someone from the center court, then I would have to go through someone. But that guy was pretty pleasant. And basically, whatever I wanted, I got. Mostly because I was also the only person asking, you know, so... Uh, well, I guess there was this one Spanish guy who wanted to talk to Galan, but you know, it's like you know, basically, I was the only person asking. But that's an exception, rather than the rule. Ninety-five uh, percent of the time, no. I, I've had a, a couple of things in the last six months as well, which, I mean, it's it's kind of mad and also funny and and makes me smile, but then also drives me mad as well. I've had um, people saying that I, I even audio okay not 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 video but even audio you can't get you can't put that you can't put your microphone there you can't get this audio you can't do that and then 20 minutes after the press conference ends they've said oh our audio messed up can you send us your audio and i'm like you know do you see the irony here i mean that you're you you okay fine we all have it we're all we're all here to help each other we're not here to to hinder so me putting my microphone, and then you saying to me, put my microphone in a different place, or I'm not allowed to put my microphone anywhere at all. And then 20 minutes after the press conference finishes, you, you're saying to me, I mean, just let's just all record and, and, and it, it's all fine. Uh, I would love to see as well the contracts that are out there for the tennis. I believe their contracts begin uh, from the coin toss to match point. Or, or the, the moment the last ball ends. I don't think there's any, there's any, because otherwise, if there was, if there was a contract for all this out there, then I think it would be dealt with a lot more strictly than, than it is. Than some random dude two weeks ago, removing some of my material, some of Shrihui's from so, uh, Twitter. Another guy I saw was an actual player complaining about how his material had been removed and then it suddenly got put back up again because there was a reaction. Oh, it's just it's very weird, very weird. Um, someone here saying feast does not appear to be growing into the sport. I'm not sure quite what He's that. He's 19, means. you know. I'm more than fine to give him time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he looks a bit older, I guess. Maybe that's one of the things that counts against him. I'm just going to watch this match to its conclusion. Is there I only one match uh, happening right now? Is uh, it just one? I mean, Nikos and Klein basically started just, just oh, okay. a second ago. But um, otherwise, yes, there's also going to be Giron, Kepfer, right? That's, I think, after Osaka. So it's going to be, it should be up pretty soon. I see that the conclusion of your match will be pretty shortly. So, yeah. 
Should be. Three match points for Volley Nets. Nets Just looking good. at the schedule for tomorrow. Anything exciting? Sigmund Ostapenko. Okay. <sighs> Do you know what that reaction was for? For my Sigmund Ostapenko. Oh, I didn't no. see the match. Oh, it's the no. match point. I haven't seen it yet. Oh. I'm not about to see it. That was not either of these things, no. Oh, okay. What was it? Google. Using Google for a schedule. That's. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. I thought it was that my excitement about Sigmund Ostapenko. No. Wow, that's a lovely winner from I said that Volinets is not going to make top 10. Uh, Katie Volinets. Vamos, Katie. Yes. There you go. On. Getting. Nurlan, are you there? Nurlan, are you listening? Oh, he's gone. He's fallen asleep for sure. Because I think he's in Turkey or somewhere in Eastern Europe. He'll have been. Turkey, yeah. I was so surprised Turkey. he joined the stream at all. But if he was, that's what he would say. <laughs> no, actually, not anymore. Oh, not she's anymore, lucky she took a set. She's lucky she took a set, I guess. That's yeah. what he would have said. Any men's exciting matches tomorrow? Just very quickly, have a look at that. Um, also on Google, of course, the go-to tennis resource. And that's why you then never know what's happening. <laughs> um... Let's see if any matches stand out for me. Mm. Safiul and Schwartzman. <laughs> Safiul is winning that, I guess. Is is that that's your reaction? I hope so. I mean, Diego really, to me, he deserves to be punished for the fact that he's too prideful to play a challenger. <laughs> You've been saying this for about six months. Yeah. Felix against Walton. Walton feels like a player that you will know something about, but also that you'll be going, you'll have a soft spot for him just because of his name. There's some sort of sort of old school name that he's got going on there. I want, don't even know what he looks like. I mean, obviously, I know him. You know, it's a. It's an ATP thousand draw. How would I not know him? But um, I don't know if I have a soft spot for him. Yeah, main quality to me. Yeah, not really yet. He pushed through the qualifying, picking Monteiro, Martinez, big battles. But you know, against Clay Quarters as well. I think he might have a hard time beating Felix. I think I've got uh, Felix in my. Um... In my bracket, uh, going through, but I think I have him going out the next round. All right, that listen. Is Morton, yes, that is Adam Morton. Former that is college Adam. player as well, for, for tennis or whatever that uh, team is. Anyway, uh, oh, tomorrow there's Nishikori coming back uh, against. Oh, Adam. okay. There's Common Wong playing against Lash Rogere. That's probably one of the best matches as well, I think. And probably the one that excites me the most. Um, out of like random things that I don't really know who's going to win. And I also don't really care, but it's going to be a good match. It's Kovacevic Maroshan as well. When is, um, what, when was that? There was a match. You'd, oh yeah, Nishikoi. Ah yeah, 515 grandstand. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's his second attempt at a comeback, I think in the last six, seven months, right? Well, he hasn't played since Atlanta, so six seven months i wouldn't say so but yeah he came back in june last year oh atlanta about june. four events no june was uh palmas del mar atlanta was in august but he was playing for yeah four events between palmas del mar and atlanta got it got it all right and well, then fingers... post atlanta yeah we haven't seen him fingers crossed he can stay healthy i don't even know how old he is now that has to be the main probably 34. Uh -huh. Mm. Well, it must be less, I think. According to Wikipedia, it's 34. He's 34. Oh, 34, really? Yeah. Oh, December so 89. Was say this. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Then he has aged even more than I thought. Yeah, 34, I guess. Yeah. Wow. I was going to say like 32 or something. That is pretty harsh. 
There you go. He's been off the tour as well for a few years. Right. That brings this uh, day uh, two of the main draw proper, at least, although it's a bit confusing because it's day one for the men and day two for the women. Uh, and we'll be back, I'm sure, in the next 24 hours with another live stream and more content, of course, on the ground from Miami. And, um, yeah, see you soon. Now I've got to find the button. Oh, here it is. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss out on all things tennis.